Hi, welcome to Elizabeth Reads. We are reading A Place Called Perfect and we are on chapter 21, William Archer. Boy looked at Violet as if she had 10 heads. He grabbed her sleeve and gestured toward the door. And you are, the man continued. Violet, Violet Brown, she stuttered. And this is my friend Boy. William Archer was a tall man, though not as tall as George. He was also a wide man, though not as wide as Edward, and this combination meant he was completely in proportion. He was unkempt, dirty, and looked like he'd spent a thousand years in his clothes. His hair was long and streaked with tones of grey. His beard was long too, and he wore both beard and hair wrapped like a scarf around his neck. His face was kind, but his eyes were unsettling. It was almost impossible not to stare at them. One was dark, almost black, while the other was a cold blue like an icy winter's morning. Violet's dad had told her that some people were born with different colored eyes, but William was the first one she'd ever met. A, cl <clears throat> a cluttered table stood by the front window, and William cleared it before gesturing for them both to sit down. Violet sat on one side and Boy on the other. A net curtain hanging in the window was stiff with dirt, and a murky brown light trickled through it across the beaten wooden table. Rusted springs, a cracked magnifying glass, and lots of small parcels wrapped in brown newspaper were piled up under the chipped, white-painted windowsill. Dust from years of stillness danced in the light as William moved books from a seat to make space. Excuse the mess, he coughed. I haven't had guests in a while. It's fine, Violet replied in her polite voice. It's just like my room. William smiled uncomfortably. Maybe he wasn't used to the company of children, or any company at all. Have you lived here long? Violet asked, breaking the awkward silence. Boy stared at his friend and frantically gestured toward the door. It's okay, boy. He's not like his brothers. And how do you know I'm not like my brothers? William asked with a hint of a smile in his voice. Because I saw your message under my desk at school and because I met your ma'am. She said you were a good son. She did? William asked, his eyes glassing over. How is Iris? Is she well? I think so. I only met her for a minute, though. I've been here so long, William whispered almost to himself. I'm not sure I remember what she looks like anymore. Everyone remembers what their ma'am looks like, no matter how long they've been away, Violet replied without thinking. She's your ma'am, isn't she? She glanced across at Boy, then down at her hands. Maybe not everyone remember their ma'am. You're a wise one for someone your age, William Archer laughed. The gentle sound filled the faded shop, and Violet knew immediately, though she'd kind of known it already, that she liked William Archer. Boy seemed to know it too, and he began to relax. So, William said, running his fingers over the frames in his hands, how did you really find my glasses? Oh, Violet exclaimed, suddenly jumping up, I'm not wearing any glasses, but I can see I'm not blind. William laughed again, a big, full laugh that almost shook the shop. It was infectious, and suddenly Boy and Violet found themselves laughing, too. So you're from perfect, he smiled, regaining a little control. No, I'm not, Violet snapped. I've lived there for a bit, but I'm not from there. She is from there, Boy teased. I'm not, though. I'm from here. Violet shot Boy a dirty look. You might not come from there originally, but you've lived there you must have. Why else would you be blind, William continued. But I'm not blind now, Violet said. That's what I'm trying to say. I know that, Violet, and I'll let you in on a secret. You never were blind. They just made you believe you were. The Watchers? Violet asked. No, my brothers. The Watchers work for them. Haven't you two figured that out yet? Violet looked at Boy and smiled. We kind of have, Boy said, but we just weren't sure. Everybody loves the Archers Imperfect. I know, William sighed. My brothers made everyone imperfect blind, and now they're all too blind to see how blind they are. It really is a conundrum. But why would they make people blind? It's a long story, Violet, William said, and you still haven't told me how you came across my glasses. I didn't know they were yours. I just found them in my bed. She looked sheepishly at Boy. Well, how did they get there? William asked, his voice still believe disbelieving. I put them there, Boy said. Ah, William smiled. I thought it might have something to do with you. All the children in no man's land have nifty fingers. I didn't steal them, Boy replied angrily. I just had them. Violet stared down at her hands, afraid she got in Boy in trouble. You still haven't answered my question, William Archer said, staring at Boy. I swear I didn't steal them. I've just always had them since I was born. In the orphanage, they joked that I was born wearing them. Then one of the nurses told me that the glasses were hidden in my blankets the day I arrived. Oh, William replied. His brow furrowed and he fell into a deep silence. 
Boy and Violet glanced across the table, afraid to break the quiet. And the nurses, did they say anything else? William suddenly asked. No, nothing. Boy was silent now too. His head dropped forward and his hand slipped down off the table. He began to fumble with something in his pocket. There's one thing, he mumbled. This was left with them. I think it's from my mother or something. He pulled out a piece of paper from his pocket and unfolded it. Catching the look of surprise on Violet's face, he blushed a rosy red as he passed the note to William. The once white paper was now gray and worn, like it was long since ripped from a notebook. Violet watched Boy as William Archer read. Then the older man carefully folded it and without a word handed the note back to her friend. Can I have a read? She asked. She was afraid he might not want her to. Their fight in the estate still fresh in her mind. Slowly, Boy passed it over and Violet opened the note. She imagined Boy's mother scribbling the mysterious message. It read, So you will never be invisible. Something about it was oddly familiar. She stared at the note for a moment, then gently folded the precious paper and handed it back to her friend. It's beautiful, Boy. He smiled, looked at it once more, then carefully put it back in his pocket. Does it mean anything to you, Mr. Archer? Violet asked. Um, no. No, Violet, it doesn't. William said, rising from the table. Now, I'm being a terrible host. Would you like some tea? I could do with a cup after all this excitement. Yes, please, Violet smiled. Do you have any of the tea from Perfect? I went off it for a bit, but I'd love a cup right now. No, Violet, there's only normal tea here, I'm afraid. William Archer left them at his table and walked back into the shadows of the room. Violet's taste buds slumped. She'd been dying for a cup of Perfect tea. She hadn't had any in ages. Her mouth watered and she was lost in a world of longing when Boy interrupted. Where do you think he's gone? He whispered. The kitchen, I suppose. Violet, after everything that's happened, you're still a little stupid. Do you really trust him? He's an archer. I think we should get out of here. No, boy, he's a good man, I can tell. Just give him a chance. Anyway, if he was evil, why would he own a pair of glasses that could make the people imperfect see reality again? Surely, if he was like his brothers, he wouldn't do that. And what about the most obvious thing? Violet whispered, leaning further across the table. He lives here in no man's land. Who'd choose that? Oh, thanks, Boy huffed. Well, you didn't really choose it. Your mother did, and she must have had her reasons. I think she was a good person. What do you mean? Well, I mean, your man must have known what was going on in Perfect. If I had a kid, I wouldn't like it to grow up there. I'd choose no man's land too, but only if I knew what was happening in Perfect. Most people are blind to it. And I think she left you the glasses because she wanted you to know what was happening too. So you could do something about it. If she couldn't, maybe she hoped her son could. I never really thought about it. Anyway, who even knows if it was me, ma'am? It could have been anyone. Like I said, I have no parents, but you have some imagination, Violet. All that from one little note. They both fell into an awkward silence. I'm sorry about what I said earlier, Violet whispered as she fiddled with a rusted spring that was lying on the table. I mean about you being an orphan. It's okay, Boy half smiled. They wouldn't take you into the orphanage anyway, he teased just as William Archer walked back into the room. He was carrying a tray laden with a teapot, chip mugs, and a handleless jug of milk. Staring at the mugs, Violet slipped into memories of the tea imperfect and all the delicious cups she'd missed the last few days. Her taste buds were watering when suddenly it hit her. The tea, she shouted, jumping up and almost knocking the tray from William's hands. It has to be the tea. Yes, calm down, Violet, boy smirked. It is only a cup of tea. No, boy, you don't understand. It's a reason I can see again without glasses. I haven't had any tea in ages. I never drank tea before I got to perfect. And the first night we arrived, the archers were there and they had tea ready. They told us everyone drinks it imperfect. And when I tried it, I knew why. It tasted like anything I wanted it to. An ice cream sundae, fizzy cola bottles, apple drops, anything. I had two cups that night. So did Mom and Dad. And the next day we were all blind. I never thought. I mean, everybody drinks it. Even in school, we have tea breaks all the time. It's only after I met Iris the other day. She said something to me in her house about not drinking it. So I didn't have any that night at home. And I haven't had any since. Now I can see again. It can't be by accident. Hmm, my brothers must have gotten better, William sighed, setting down the tray. In my time, they were using drops. They prescribed them to everyone for all sorts of eye ailments. It didn't matter what. They even poured them in people's drinks when they weren't looking. It was a messy business, the drops, and now I imagine the tea distort the retina at the back of the eye, 
rendering a person almost blind, therefore in need of glasses. The glasses my brothers give you when you come to them looking for help counteract this distortion, but that's not all they do. They're called BR glasses, and they're very clever. They make you see whatever my brothers want you to see, and anything they don't becomes invisible. They also have an earpiece that filters out any sounds that they don't want you to hear. Genius, really. What's BR stand for? Boy asked. Oh, excuse me, William said. It's a scientist in me. BR stands for bended reality. That's what the glasses do. They're programmed so that the wearer's reality is controlled by my brothers, and they only experience the things my brothers want them to. Of course, the hearing only works when a person is wearing their glasses. I presume that's still the case. It's a flaw Ed and George could never get around. Yes, Violet nodded. Whenever my glasses fell off, I could hear boy. I kind of thought I was going mad. We think that's why there's a curfew in Perfect, so the people don't hear the no man's landers at night. So nobody in Perfect can see or hear me or any of us in no man's land, boy added, now red-faced with anger. Because the archers don't want them to? Precisely, William said. Now you're getting it. Why didn't you stop them, Violet asked. Well, at first I tried, and I had some support, William began. You see, in the beginning, it took a while for people to change. The drops weren't efficient enough, and so those who weren't changing noticed what was going on and tried to do something about it. Soon, though, most people succumbed to the effects. The town appeared perfect to them, and they stopped listening. Then the watchers came on board. Edward hired them straight out of prison. They were paid to keep the remaining rebels in check. Later, my brothers decided they didn't want people who disagreed with their ideas of perfection living imperfect at all. They walled in part of the town, now called No Man's Land, and threw all of us in here. They got the watchers to make certain we stayed put by whatever means necessary. A silence filled the shop as William Archer gathered his emotions. The strain of the memories was written on his face. I didn't give up, he continued at last. I set up my workshop so I could start work on my own glasses, ones that would show the people of Perfect the reality they were living in, he said, picking up the wooden frames from the table. You said the last time you saw those glasses, your brothers had them, boy asked. William looked at the box in his hands. Yes, he nodded. I believe that my mother Immacula had gone under the effects of Perfect. They hadn't turned up in no man's land, you see, so I snuck into town with the glasses. I was hoping that if they could just put them on, they'd know I hadn't left, that I hadn't gone away. But I never reached them. One of the watchers caught me and brought me to Edward and George, who took the glasses. I was beaten that day. An awkwardness settled over them, and Violet rattled her brains for something to say to ease the tension of William's memories. Who's Macula? she asked. Just someone I knew once. William moved his hands in front of his face to shed his shield his tears, and Violet wished she hadn't tried to change the subject. Quickly, he wiped his cheeks and began to pour the tea. But how did I get the glasses, boy asked quietly. William and Violet looked at him, and the group fell into silence. I think I know, Violet said, sitting forward, her imagination on overtime. I bet your mom worked for the archers, and she probably eavesdropped and knew what was happening. Then maybe she found the glasses in the shop and tried them on. Maybe she was scared, and she loved you so much, she saved you and put the glasses in your blanket, so one day you could save her too. When you were older, of course, a baby wouldn't be able to save anyone. Boy looked uncertainly at William. It's plausible. They did have different ladies cleaning the shop over the years, boy. It is highly possible someone found out about their plot. William nodded, handing him a cup. I'm okay for tea, thanks, boy said. It's safe, William smiled. I'm not like them. I'll never be like them. His tone was firm, and boy accepted the cup. Violet looked over at her friend and then took the first sip. That's the end of the chapter. See you next time. Bye-bye.